Your nose is used for lots of things, sniffing out uh, good things, maybe sniffing out a clue, but certainly for the aesthetics of what it brings to taste and other senses. But could it also be an early indicator of what's going on in your brain? In our Brain Power segment today, uh, we're taking a look at what the nose knows about Parkinson's disease before those symptoms become obvious. Uh, joining us is Professor Kevin Barnum, who is head of the Neuropath uh, Neuro Therapeutics Lab, I should say, at the Floro Flory Institute of Neuroscience. Uh, hello to you, Professor. Hello, Sonia. Good to talk with you. And Leah Beecham, PhD candidate in neurotherapeutics uh, lab at the same Flory Institute. Hello to you, Leah. Hi, Sonia. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank you. Now, Professor, um, smell. What is the connection that our nose has with the brain? Oh, the, no the nose is, 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 is uh, an open highway to the brain. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically where, where the, the closest bit to where the environment impacts on the brain. Um, and, uh, and as such, it's, it, it's the most susceptible part to, uh, um, environmental insults, et cetera. And so um, yeah, there, there's a, there, there is a reason why certain people, you know, take drugs nasally. Right, because it's a direct way to impact on the brain. So what does it tell us about a disease like Parkinson's disease? What it tells us about a disease like Parkinson's disease is that it, 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 um, it starts a, a lot earlier than, than, than we, we thought. I mean, um, you know, we're used to thinking about Parkinson's disease as being a disease of the ageing, um, an aged disease, but... The way we're starting to think about this disease is actually probably a disease of middle age. Um, and um, one of the early indicators is, 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 um, is that, that something's going wrong uh, with, with, with olfaction. I mean, you know, I like to think about the disease as like a bomb. You know, the old-fashioned, you know, wily Coyote Roadrunner type bomb. And, and the disease, when we see the disease in the clinic, the bomb has exploded. And, and what's happening is there's a fuse leading to that bomb. That, that fuse is 20 years long. And, and what we're trying to understand is, 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 is the, the nature of that fuse or, and, and, and whether we, we have the opportunity to cut the fuse. Mm. And that's where Leah has been uh, pivotal. Uh, so we've brought Leah on board to, to look at that uh, and, and to tell us more about it. And what are you finding, Leah? So we know that um, about 90% of people with Parkinson's disease do in fact have a loss in the sense of smell, even if they don't necessarily realise it. Um, and I've found that um, we're seeing changes in key, what we call neurotransmitters in this brain region that's responsible for our loss of smell. So it's the, it's the same brain region that we're seeing many years later become affected in the midbrain causing um, sort of those, those classical movement disorders uh, like tremor and things like that. So it looks like we're having, although they're, they're different changes, it looks like similar neurotransmitters are responsible for the changes we see in our loss of smell. And, and what are you estimating is the period of time before those tremors start at which you're starting to lose that sense of smell? So it's been reported anywhere from three years to a decade before tremor. People have noticed subtle um, changes in their ability to smell and therefore their ability to taste. And and so uh, if, if you were to start getting checked out early enough when that sense of smell or taste is impacted, could we uh, at this point stop that fuse at all? No, um, well, unfortunately, we don't really understand the fuse yet. So, so my work is uh, essentially it's we're trying to define what that fuse might mean, so that we can measure um, a myriad of changes that are happening in that time, and we can categorise people as likely to develop Parkinson's disease. Therefore, we're able to intervene with these people much earlier. But at the moment, we we don't understand the nature of this fuse, and we don't have any um, any drugs that can stop it yet. Now, but can I can I just comment there though? We, we we do that is that is the ultimate goal is is, is to generate uh, that 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 knowledge, and and that's what my laboratory is trying to do. We we do have drugs that, that are currently in the clinic.
planning for different indications, which we believe might be able to, you know, stop the de degeneration before we reach the motor symptoms. So, in fact, you know, prevent the motor symptoms from from coming to pass. Um, but we do need to understand the biology and the chemistry of, of, of what's happening in the nose before we can be a, a bit more definitive mm -hmm. about that. Um, and, but what Leah was saying is the chemistry, it looks like the chemistry, the biochemistry that occurs in the nose is the same as what's occurring in the, in the midbrain. And so that, that's encouraging. And, and you mentioned neurotransmitters, transmitters linked to Parkinson's. Are they also linked to other conditions? I guess the reason I'm asking this is that if we can figure out the answer to this in relation to Parkinson's, might it also have relevance to other conditions? Yes. Yeah. So um, I guess the, the primary neurotransmitter that I'm talking about here is um, dopamine. And we do know that uh, dopaminergic changes are also underlie diseases such as schizophrenia. Um, and these diseases also underlie uh, or are aligned, I should say, with um, a loss in the sense of smell. So the more we can learn about the specific role of these transmitters, although they may be acting differently and causing different kinds of impairments in other diseases such as Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia, um, the more we're going to be able to help all of those diseases in general. Um, we're talking with Professor Kevin Barnum and Leah Beecham, a PhD candidate, both of them from the Neurotherapeutics Lab at the Florey Institute, um, doing some amazing work on perhaps whether we can detect Parkinson's early by a loss of smell. There is a, a definite connection. Now, Leah, it doesn't sound like the most attractive uh, research methods that you have to use to find out more <laughs> about this. No, um, I've got to say it does take a little bit of convincing patients when I'm asking to collect their snot that I'm not a crazy woman, but a, a mad scientist. <laughs> so it, what are we finding out from the snot? What is it about that that makes it so valuable? Well, we haven't, uh, the, the clinical trial is still ongoing and the analysis is still underway. But the interesting thing about this nasal fluid is, um, as Kevin mentioned earlier, the neurons where this fluid um so the brain cells that this fluid runs over, they are direct projections down from the brain. So there are cells that come from the brain into your nasal cavity. And there's potential that these cells, when they're under duress in a disease like Parkinson's, are releasing factors. So by collecting this nasal lavage, we might be collecting um, some of these released factors. And if we can quantify them and determine whether they're related to Parkinson's disease, um, we may develop a potential biomarker for us to help diagnose patients. Professor Kevin Barnum, we, we know, um, and this may be slightly off topic, but we know that at the moment with COVID-19, one of the symptoms is a loss of smell and taste. Is there any link in, in what you're looking at and how the brain responds to that? I'm, I'm just wondering if there, there might be a sign that this means COVID has, is working on the brain in some way if it's having that same symptom? It's a great question, Sonia, and it's one that Leah and I have just been putting a lot of thought into over the last few weeks. Um, it's one of the interesting uh, things that are unknown about the, the Spanish flu pandemic that occurred you know, just over 100 years ago to now is it was followed by a, a very significant increase in the, in, the, in the rate of Parkinson's disease. And the bottom line is we know that viruses that get into the brain and cause inflammation prime the brain for uh, further insults and, and, and make you more susceptible to Parkinson's disease. So the loss of smell is almost certainly an indication that the, that the, the virus is affecting the brain. The con long-term consequences of that are potentially very, very significant. And it's something that we're looking at now and something that we're, um, uh, yeah, uh, I think, the goal of keeping numbers down is, is laudable. I, I think the, the strategy, anyone that thinks the strategy of herd immunity, uh, uh, it, that would be a disaster, to be brutally honest. I think long-term down the track, disaster. So, yes, the short answer is yes, I believe. We believe that, 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 that the loss of smell in COVID has potential implications for what we're, we're describing as a third wave of, of, the, of, of the virus. If I'm understanding this correctly, are you saying that if you've had COVID-19 and survived, mm -hmm. that the potent, um, potentially your brain might be weaker or more susceptible to diseases like Parkinson's in future. Definitely.
That's amazing, Professor. It's it's amazing. It's, it's scary. I think I think it's it, I think it's again it's another reason to you know we, we need to keep numbers low and 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 uh, thankfully here in Australia the numbers have been kept low. Uh, it's scary to think about what might be happening in other places in the world you know five ten years from now as well. So in a sense, this loss of smell is opening up a pathway to the brain, whatever causes it. For for it, it's in marker, which other yeah, it's a marker that something has gone wrong, that your brain is being affected. So even if you've survived well, there could be implications for the future. Your risk factor will be increased. If you've had a loss of smell, and even if you had... And, and part of the problem we have here, of course, is that most people won't know they've had a loss of smell. If your nose is runny and, and, and et cetera, and you've got breathing difficulties, the last thing you're thinking about is a mild, a mild, you know, a mild loss of smell or, or your food's not tasting quite as well. It's, um, it, it's quite fascinating. Is there any way that you can... Uh shut up that gate or, sh- you know, close down that highway, um, improve your sense of smell? Do we know what weakens it? No, we don't. That, that, that's all part of what, what we need to do. We need to, we need to learn more. I mean, you know, we're going to need to monitor uh, these patients moving forward. Um, but we need to learn more. I think, you know, it's, it's only really in the last five years or so that we've really started understanding when, when the concept of Parkinson's disease. I mean, Parkinson's disease, Disease was first described over 200 years ago, the first case, and it's really only now that we're starting to get a feel for this. What so about there's a lot of work to do? What about other brain conditions? I mean, when you're talking about Parkinson's, but what about things like motor neurone disease, dementia? Yes, well, there, there is certainly in terms of Alzheimer's disease, there, there has been reports of uh, uh, hyposmia and, and lack of smell, olfactory deficits in, in some of those diseases. So again, just in relation to the link with COVID, would that make you more likely or more susceptible to those brain conditions also? I think the link there is, we don't know, this is a short answer. I think the link is a little more tenuous than it is with Parkinson's disease. Right. Um, it's fascinating. So how far down the track are you with, with, with this research, Leo? I mean, are you starting to see some of the results of, uh, of the testing that you're doing with all this snot? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So I'm I'm pretty much at the end of my PhD, but this is a um a clinical trial that's only been started in the last six months. So I've spent a lot of my time sort of doing the background research with um, animals and brain tissue to get to the hypothesis we have now. Um, so this is very much going to be um, sort of coming along. The the results will be coming along over the next hopefully twelve months, depending on the the COVID situation. And, and yeah, pre- it's, it's worth pointing out that obviously the, the COVID um, uh, pandemic has, has interfered with, with, with that aspect of Leah's research. I mean, going around trying to collect, you know, that material in this yes. current environment is problematic. Yes, indeed, indeed. Well, Professor, I mean, it sounds like an amazing um, um, uh, area that you're working on. If we can get an answer to this, how optimistic are you that this, this might prove, uh, you know, that early intervention with Parkinson's might be possible and make a difference to, to people who are suffering from it? I'm, I'm very optimistic, Sonia. I mean, I, I, uh, the bottom line is that, you know, by identifying people at this very early stage, we have a chance to intervene before there's too much damage. I mean, I use the bomb analogy on, on purpose because once someone shows up at, in the clinic with Parkinson's disease and or any of the other neurogen diseases, a lot of the damage is already done. And so that makes it very, very hard to, to rescue something. It's dip, almost, you can't rescue something that's dead. Okay? You, you need to be able to rescue something that's still alive. Um, you can replace the stuff that's dead, and I'm, there are people working on that. But you know, from my perspective, as trying to develop therapeutics, I need to be able to rescue something that's still alive. And that means the earlier we get there, the better, the more likely the drugs that we're making will work. Professor, fascinating stuff. Our brains are amazing things, aren't they? Uh, they and, certainly are. Uh, and it seems like as much as we know heaps about them, we also equally don't know heaps <laughs> or enough yet. Um, and it gra- it's great the work that you're doing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Professor Kevin Barnum and also Leah Beecham, both of them. Um, Professor he- um, Kevin Barnum is head of the Neurotherapeutics Lab at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Leah Beecham is a PhD candidate there as well. We thank them both. For that.